Yeah? yeah? Right? Yes. Oh, deal? Doink. Welcome to the Acquia Podcast, Drupal Technology, Community and Business. Welcome to the Acquia Podcast, Drupal Technology, Community and Business. There's a module for that? There, of course there is. So let's just jump right in on that point. New contributors, new mm, users, new participants in, yes. in open source software in Drupal. I guess we're mostly focusing on Drupal today. Yep. I love that our community has done really, really well on a part of a formula that you were talking about today. So um, I paraphrased doing a tweet and I was so impressed with the formula that you came up with. It said, um, essentially, diversity is well and good, important, yes, but without inclusion, mm -hmm. right, there can be no inequality. Talk about, talk about that, uh, that formula. Sure. So I think, um, I think we're doing a good job. We as a technology community are doing a good job working on the pipeline with organizations like uh, Girls Who Code, Black Girls Code, um, even coding boot camps, um, targeting you know non-traditional non -traditional technology workers, getting people back into the workforce after they've left. Um, but my concern is that we're going to produce, you know, I could make an army, for example, of 100 female developers, and then they could go out into the workplace, and then they wouldn't feel great, right? Because we're not focusing on inclusion. It would be a great band name, though. It would be a great band name. Um, and I also would just love to have an army of 100 female developers just marching shoulder to shoulder. But in order for us to support diversity, we have to focus on inclusion and we have to focus on equality. And for me, inclusion is really the number one. And it's something that all of us can do. Like I said in my talk, like we, I can't control the number of females, uh, women, minorities entering computer science. I can control how inclusive my communities are. And so, and that's something that we can all control. And that's why I try to talk about it. Yeah, and I love the mentoring culture that we've um, really focused on in the last few years in yeah. Drupal and the new contributor sprints and this incredible encouragement to accept every kind of contribution yes. as, as valid and important. Yeah, and it's it can be so intimidating. Issue queues can be so intimidating. DrupalCon can be so intimidating. And I think we do we're doing a, a pretty good job. We can always do better of like you said, new like new contributor sprints. I was a mentor at DrupalCon for the new contributor sprints. And so many people got their first commit and it's like the doors just bust open. Like, oh my gosh, all I have to do is find a typo and submit a patch and I'm officially a Drupal contributor. There's a really powerful psychological um uh well there's a powerful Psychologically, um, ownership yes. is really, really powerful. Yes. And when you've got, when you've fixed a typo, right, and your fix is being downloaded 300,000, a half a million times yeah. a month, yeah. that's your baby all of a sudden. Mm -hmm. Like, and then you really start to, to like, l I think literally love it and care about it. Mm -hmm. And those moments when people get their first patches and it's just, <gasps> yeah, because what seemed to be so much for others is now mine. And it's, um, I, and I think we, it's easy to devalue, oh, well, I just fixed a, a missing period. I just fixed the small thing. But those small things, no one starts with a core commit, you know, patching views. No one starts there. We all start with these small contributions. Um, and actually, I wanted to use uh, this afternoon in my talk, I wanted to use two Edward Burke quotes after you used one yeah. this morning. And, and that idea of, of doing something no matter how small to improve something, right, make something better. Uh, that, that's really, really powerful. I think we have to uh, acknowledge and celebrate the long tail, right? Absolutely. And you see this in a lot of other communities, a lot of other social movements, um, whether you agree with it or not, right? Veganism talks about this. Um, animal cruelty dog shelters talk about this. I can't save every dog. I can adopt one. I can make a huge difference in that one dog's life. I can not, I, you know, I can eat vegan and save one cow. Um, and I think, you know, we could do a better job of saying, like, your tiny contribution is so important. Obviously, with this, with this idea of ownership, we could also touch on, on enlightened self-interest. Like, I've made something better because I found a problem and I fixed it for me. Yeah. But in open source, um, giving someone the gift of being able to open source or giving someone the gift of an improved project, right? Yeah. It's, it's better for all of us. It is. And I... And I think we shouldn't um, undervalue self-interest, 
right? We're all here. Ultimately, we have we have to pay our rent, right? We have to make money, and we get to be do all this wonderful community stuff as a byproduct. And so, sure, I contribute because it benefits me, and I and it makes me feel whether it's financially or it just makes me feel good. Um, and so, helping people just care about making your own product better, and that energy is contagious, and that energy fuels it all. I think. So talking about contribution, talking about diversity, I've been working in these areas on and off, um, uh, even even pre-Drupal and pre-open source software. Um, a lot of what I'm thinking about these days, mid-2016, um, is saying, okay, a lot of us are idealists, yeah. a lot of us are software hippies, we really yeah. care about people, we really want to make the world a better place, and that's all valid. Mm -hmm. I'm convinced that there is a business case to everything that we do, it's not just because it's the right thing to do, right? Contribution has very strong, provable, measurable business advantages. Talk about the business case for diversity. Sure, that's a great question. I love the phrase software hippie, by the way. I'm going to steal that. Um, there's a ton of stats. One that I had in my speaker notes that I didn't mention was that um, if you look at companies that are diverse, the companies, teams that are diverse are 35% more likely to financially outperform. Um, companies that are not, divor not diverse are 15% more likely to underperform. So you've got this diversity spectrum, right, of literally every color of the rainbow, for lack of a better term, and then, you know, totally homogenous. And you're going to do 50, 60, 70% better than a team made up of the same skill set because you have different kinds of people in the room. Um, I think the richness of perspective always leads to better solutions. Um, if, it's, if it's, you know... Um, white marketing guys with mustaches, right? We, we're going to come up with a great solution for the first world problem of getting the right curl in the morning, right? <laughs> but there's uh, so many things in the world that I don't really, I haven't experienced or I don't know about, right? Mm. Having colleagues that come f literally from, well, having colleagues from other geographies, other ethnic ethnicities, mm. um, belief systems and so on, just gives them perspective and it uh, allows them to see problems in a, in a light that I never could, right? Yeah, and this is why we do user stories. This is why we do user interviews. Like we, we all already believe this. We all believe, oh, I have to get this other person's perspective to make the software better. So we go to our client and we interview their users and we interview their stakeholders and their project managers to make software that works for them. So why don't we do that on our teams also? Right. We need to we need to sort of have a mirror there for ourselves. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And and so having someone and you could having someone with a Java background, having someone with, you know, a C plus plus background, those are people are gonna make the software better too. Right. And diversity is 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 uh, if you imagine a sphere completely densely packed with lines going straight through it, that's how many axes of diversity are there are. Right. It's not man, woman, white, black, Christian, other. Right. Mm -hmm. and those are factors for sure. Um, I cut my intersectionality slide for time, but we talk about intersectionality a lot. Right. And if you really picture an intersection of a road with two, you know, just a, t a normal, you know, four stop road, there's only four ways to look at the middle of the road. If you think about a thousand roads meeting at one point, you have a thousand ways to look at that thing in the middle. And that's really what we want. We want all of those perspectives to help us solve our problems. So touching on this idea of neither of us can see everything from enough perspectives, yeah. talk about your survey project that you're building right now. Great question. So there's been a bunch of surveys out recently about the diversity of the web and the people who make the web um, or people who use software like New Relic. And so they put out soft, they put out surveys and the surveys say, are you male or female? Are you white, black or Mexican maybe, right? And they just have these really small number of options. And so we were meeting at DrupalCon New Orleans and we said, you know what we need is a survey that represents everybody. Um, and even if it's just numbers, we want every single identity to be represented. And we want people, I want anybody to be able to take the survey and say, there's a box for me, or there's a way for me to indicate who I am um, for the identities that are important to me. So Nick from Pantheon um, and I are working on a diversity survey. It's 100% open source. It's on GitHub. We're currently looking for contributors to help us make this survey questions better. And once we get enough contributors and we feel like everyone's represented, we're going to send it out and then we're going to open source 100% of the data. And that's, um, I think, really the cool part is that, you know, companies send out these surveys and then they just give us the results of the data. And they say, OK, it's 20% um, women anyway, um, but you can't do anything with that. So in the spirit of Drupal, we're crowdsourcing the entire thing and then open sourcing all of the data so data scientists everywhere can do what they want with it. So first bike shed. Yes. Then bike shed some more. Yes. 
then make sure everybody else has had a chance to bike shed. Yes. Uh, this, this is, this, does this sound familiar? Yes. And then once we've had that bike shedding, um, Christmas and Easter go, no. I'm <laughs> yes. Okay. But anyway, um, open for discussion right now in real time, time. mid August 2016. I'm hoping to publish this within uh, a couple of three weeks. What is your aim? Uh, once it's rolling, do you have any specific ideas about what you might want to do with that data? Or is this a kind of let's get it out there and see what people figure out sort of thing? Um, it's both. It Primarily, it's let's get the data out there and see what people can do about it. Because again, together, we're going to have better ideas than any one of us. Um, but it's also to say, let's take a picture of what Drupal looks like right now. Um, and expanding, if we end up accessing people who don't do Drupal even better, let's get a snapshot of the people who make the web right now and make that snapshot as inclusive as possible. And then we have a benchmark for what we can run it again in three years and say, great, do we have more underrepresented individuals working on the web? Um, and I guess we, we might be able to compare um, different communities and their success at different uh, aspects and maybe geographies and so on, right? Yeah, and it's hard because, again, I believe so much in inclusion. You can't measure inclusion on a survey, really. Right, so we could measure what's what percentage of users identify as female, um, or what percentage identify as homosexual. But it's ha much harder to measure. Do I feel good about going to work? Do I feel safe in my job? Um, and so that's something that we're still we're still exploring, and we can bike shit about <laughs> for a while. Um, it's definitely it's a work in progress, and I think that's also why we're so desperate for contributors. We want all the voices to be heard. That's so interesting. Um, that's so interesting, and I guess to be. Frank, um, I, I'm in marketing, so we think about data a lot nowadays in, 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 in our profession. Um, um, of course, ideally, you'd come up with that three and a half thousand question survey that really <laughs> nails it, right? But, but uh, um, uh, the problem that, that, that the, it excites me right now is actually, um, first of all, how do I feel about something and what do I think about what I'm doing? That's fascinating and incredibly hard to measure. Um, also, how do you boil it down into something that I can finish in a half an hour or, you know, um, which is already a lot of time to ask of people, right? Yeah, so we're, I mean, we're, which is, again, why we need more contributors, because it's like, well, when, once you're pushing 20 questions, two pages, you know, people have, I want it to be something you're waiting for a pull request to be approved and you're like, okay, bop, 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 I'm done. We want to make it, you know, really lower the barrier to contribution. Okay, and then maybe one, two, three, uh, where I can write a paragraph of what question did you forget or, you know, how, what, what do you care about? What should we ask about next time? Something like that. Yeah, absolutely. And personally, I want to do um, some more qualitative follow-up uh, with people who are willing to talk about their inclusion experiences. Um, so that's something I'm working on separate. But yeah, I think having, I would love a pull request on uh, some survey feedback at the end of the survey. Very cool. That could also make for an incredibly interesting podcast or series of podcasts just talking about the results or, or following up with specific individuals who, who seemed to have um, particularly um, germane ideas or, or, helpful, or helpful thoughts about that. Yeah. Where can we find this to help out? You can go, you can follow me on Twitter. Dr. Nikki. Dr. Nikki, D-R-N-I-K-K-I. -K -K -I. And you can go to my website, drnikki.org, D-R-N-I-K-K-I.org, and there will be links and blog posts. There's already blog posts up about it, um, and then everything's on GitHub, but you can find it on my website. Cool. I will definitely tweet about it. That's incredibly interesting. Now, turn back the clock. Oh, no. Nikki Stevens, yes. 2009. Yes. What were you doing, and how did you encounter Drupal the very first time? I was working as a web developer at DivX. Um, and they had an internet on Drupal 5, and they hired a guy named Steve Rude. Steve! Steve, Steve Rude. And they brought him in to do their new DivX.com site in Drupal 6. So Steve Rude taught me Drupal, as he loves to brag. That's pretty cool. And um, what's your first Drupal memory, maybe apart from Steve? Apart from Steve, um, writing tokens. Writing my first token replacement module was the very first thing that I did. And I broke production. I broke production a couple times. Wow, that's cool. How did you do that? Um, I We were using Subversion, and Steve was out of the office, and we had to push an emergency fix. And I edited some code, committed it, didn't test it, and pushed it up. Um, and I added a closing PHP tag to a module, <gasps> committed that to Subversion, and deployed it. Oh, continuous <laughs> integration, how we, how we love her. Wonderful. Cool. So... <laughs> um, so you, your first version of Drupal was Drupal 6. 
Yeah, at, DSM five, but yeah. At DivX. Um, why don't you could well compare Drupal then mm. to Drupal now? There's a lot that I really liked about five and six, and just in that it felt more accessible to a new PHP developer. Not a new to Drupal. I had already been a PHP developer for ten years at that point, but um, coming in, it was overwhelming, but not immeasurably so. Um, and there wasn't so much for me front end burden. And I feel like now there's the system is so massive for the better, I think, but the system is so massive and the learning curve is so steep and there's so much front end stuff uh, that for me as a command line user and as a just kind of code monkey, um, and I've, I've deployed sites on Drupal 8, it still is kind of like, ah, this is, this is really big. Do we need all this? <laughs> Yeah, and um, I mean, and the, the the world of front end in the last ten years has just exploded. I mean, with the with with like logic in your CSS templates, which still blows my mind. Yeah. Um, and I know that's just a simple trick, but yeah. I mean, and so much going on, and now this decoupling and all of the front end frameworks. Yeah. Um, my one my possibly very first ambition uh, getting into Drupal was actually to be a front ender. And now I look back at the learning curve of the last decade. <laughs> I'm like, wow. So that um, switch into marketing somehow, you know, cool, okay. <laughs> I saved myself. I mean, it's wonderful and beautiful, but that's not, it's, there's so much going on. There's so much going on. And I have so much respect for front end developers. Um, I feel like I got off, I get off easy generally not having to worry about browser stuff or compliance or I just write my code and test it. Although, you know, Nikki, with Drupal 8 and HTML5, we've got pretty great cross-browser compatibility built in. Uh, so I've heard. I don't investigate. <laughs> <laughs> the, um, and actually, speaking of awesome front-endness, have you seen in the Drupal 8.2 beta, the outside-in module, what it does? I have seen it, and there's... And I love Drupal, so this is not really a criticism, but there's a huge part of me that's like, um, I just want to make a little PHP site. I don't. This is too much. <laughs> Yeah, so um, my, my blog has stagnated in the last few months because, you know, it always happens. But m my blog is in Jekyll right now just because it's like... Me too. Just because, like, r r write a thing in, in, my, um, in my text editor. Um, which one do I use now? Text. Probably Sublime or Atom. Yeah, anyway. Well, I mean, one of the ones that... Um, so I have it set in, you know, HTML or Markdown with, with you know, yeah. uh, code completion and all that. And yeah. checking, syntax checking. But I, I just... I literally... I write a plain text file and and stir the pot and a bulletproof, really fast website comes out the other end. That's that's still pretty... That's still pretty fun. I My site's also in Jekyll for the same reason. Yeah. I had a Drupal site for a while because it's, you know, eat your own dog food and... Um, I don't. I feel like I eat enough of it. <laughs> so I did promise Bo Simonson to redo my site in Sculpin because that's PHP. Great. Of course, it is great. But now that Drupal eight is um, is great um, and the like, the Bootstrap theme is really solid. I think I'm actually gonna I'm gonna go and and build Drupal eight site for myself and do that. And I think that's my next like that's one of my next projects. Nikki, yes. it's so cool to hang out with you. I don't think yeah. we've actually really seen each other in years, which I is which is a pity. But thank you so much thank for you. taking the time to talk with me. Um, all that you've done, mentoring, contributing, being cool and interesting. Um, this diversity topic, I would love if it went away and we never had to talk about it. Yeah. But um, let's keep on it and keep making small improvements for everybody so that we can all have a better Drupal and a better world? Is that and a better world, yeah. And the best thing we can do is just keep talking about it. All right. Thank you, Nikki. Thank you. Happy? Happy. That was fun. That was fun.